Corey Reed asks, could you review the new sushi burrito place that you visited this week? Absolutely. So in D.C., just this last Monday, a new place opened up called Burrito. Uh, and Burrito is a sushi the size of a burrito. <laughs> so, okay, so you go to Sushi Bar and you got your little sushi rounds and little one-inch, you know, pods, right? And they're about, you know, maybe about an inch around or if you get the Fudomaki, sometimes they're like that big around. Well, imagine if you get a Fudomaki roll all by itself, just cut diagonal down the middle like a giant burrito. It's, or like a wrap. You know, you can think of it as a wrap. But, I mean, they're going for burrito style. So, the burrito has a lot of really awesome options, including, um, you know, different mixes of fish and stuff and different uh, mixes of, like, tempura versus, uh, like, raw fish versus, um, like, unagi sauce versus sriracha mayonnaise and all kinds of vegetables and stuff in between. Kimchi, coleslaw, awesome, awesome options. I had, all, oh, and all the burritos are named after, the burritos, are named after uh, characters from Kill Bill. So um, I had the Beatrix, as in Beatrix Haddo, um, the, uh, the, the primary badass character by Uma Thurman, and that was a tuna salmon tempura crunchies with um, uh, cabbage and scallions and unagi sauce. And it was fucking amazing. It was completely fucking amazing. And it's the amount of fish that you would get in, like, six pieces of nigiri wrapped up in a giant, giant, like, roll. And um, my friend who went with me, Ray, shout out Ray, um, had the, uh, the Sophie, uh, which was a shrimp tempura crunchy uh, roll uh, that that had other kinds of vegetables and peppers and stuff in it was sriracha mayonnaise. Um, he chose to not have the sriracha mayonnaise, but instead had the unagi sauce. Still good. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, if you're into sushi, it's definitely a good place to go. They also have a pork cutlet version, so if you're not into raw fish, you can get the pork. And I did ask them if they were going to have eel. They haven't said yes or no. I told them, please, please, please get an eel roll, because I would eat the fuck out of an eel roll, like, all the time. So, yes, burrito, two thumbs up. Daniel asks, how many years do you think it will take until sexual orientation is made a protected class in the USA? That is a really tough question, and especially politically charged question. So, um, protected classes are something that kind of flows out of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So, most of the things that we know that are protected classes are things that we recognize as being part of the regular discriminatory practices usually tied to Southern uh, Jim Crow laws. So like race, ethnicity, uh, um, you know, uh, religion, things like that, um, that are, are highly recognized discriminatory acts. Um, over the years, additional amendments have been made to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and additional acts have added protective classes to things like familial status, pregnancy status, veteran status, um, disabilities, things like that. So the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1973, I think it is, um, added, you know, any kind of disability protections um, as a protected class. Um, so in order for us to include that, um, include LGBT sexual orientation. So it wouldn't be LGBT, it would be sexual orientation and gender identity. Those are the two things that would need to be added to make queer, trans people uh, included in protected classes. So the discrimination against them is illegal, completely illegal. Because right now there's like 31 states where it's completely legal and no one can do anything about it. So like these people that post, like, no gays loud on their door, in a lot of places, most places in this country, that's perfectly legal. And that's insane. Most people don't think that that's legal. They think that, that you can't do that. And they're wrong. And that there was actually a really great article that came out this week, and I'll put a link to this article down in the crotch, about the challenges that we face in the next levels of equality. Um around the around protected classes most people think that 
it's illegal to discriminate against gay and lesbian and trans people. But in reality, that's not the case. So how do we reconcile the fact that there's all these people who already think it's legal, but in reality, it's not legal, and how do we get those people who think it's legal on board with us to say, oh shit, let's fix this? Because how do you get people allied to fix something that they think is already fixed? That's a tough, tough thing. So. It's going to take these cases of these asshole people, like these florists and these bakers and this dude with the hardware store, like, <laughs> to actually go to court for act actively discriminating against people and for courts to start striking that shit down. Um, so until that happens, it's going to take some time, unless we go through a legislative process. And so if we get the Congress, <laughs> if we get Congress to write a bill, uh, pass a bill, and the president to sign a bill into law to incorporate gender identity and sexual orientation as protected classes, we will still face these kinds of things. So that's going to take an overhaul in Congress, because there's no way in hell that the GOP Congress that we have right now is going to ever, ever, ever do that. And to have a sitting Democratic president to sign that into law. So if in 2016 or 2020, whenever, we have a big overhaul in who's in Congress, then maybe, maybe. So somewhere between five and ten years, I imagine, but maybe not before then. John Dickinson again asks, uh, what equipment do you use to film your videos? I use a Nikon Coolpix camera that I bought at Walmart for like a hundred bucks. I got some extra batteries and some extra SD cards, and I edit all my stuff on a really, really old version of iMovie. Um, it works. Rick McGray asks, in your home movie collection, what are your top five movies? Um, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, and if you're one of the early Men of the Den watchers, you know all about my love for Elvira. I'm going to put a link down in the crotch to my movie review of Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, just so you can go back and watch it again. Harold and Maude uh, is one of my absolute favorites. Um, uh, Ruth Gordon and Bud Court are in this, it's not even a May-December relationship, it's like a, an April-December relationship. Um, and it's just loaded with awesome uh, like things about life and aging and love and all this wonderful music by Cat Stevens. It's definitely weird and it's loving and tender and funny and poignant and I absolutely love this movie. I've seen it dozens and dozens of times. David Cronenberg's film adaptation of Naked Lunch. I bought the Criterion edition of this because I love this movie so much. I saw this movie at a weird, young, impressionable age <laughs> and I read the book at an equally young and impressionable age and David Cronenberg is, like, the daddy of body horror, bodily horror. Like, this is, like, cockroaches that turn into pulsating assholes and giant weird alien monsters that people milk and suckle, like, this, like, seminal-type fluid from their head teats and, like, everyone's on fucking drugs and then they're in Morocco and they're doing Arab boys and the Arab boys turn into scorpions. It's like, it's so fucked up. Like, I told you there's another movie that's weirder. This is the movie that's the weirder one. <laughs> so, Naked Lunch. It's an awesome movie. You should totally watch it. The last two I have are horror movies. Um, there's a lot of horror in my collection. That's just, my, that's just who I am, baby. Um, the Wicker Man, starring Christopher Lee. Long may he live in the realms of the mighty now that he's passed away. Um, the Wicker Man is an amazing British uh, psychological like drama horror film. Um, and it's about crazy pagans off on an island off the edge of Scotland and um, this cop that is investigating the murder of a young girl, and it's awesome. It's totally awesome. Christopher Lee is a badass, and it has the best depiction of sex magic you will ever find in any movie ever. Britt Eklund, who I think was Rod Stewart's wife, Britt Eklund is this sex kitten, like, innkeeper's daughter who's, like, trying to seduce the cop, to come and have sex with her in her room. And she sings this song and does this dance and she's just like working the magic and it's so fucking good. 
Totally watch this movie, The Wicker Man. Don't watch the one with Nicolas Cage. It's an abomination. Watch the one with Christopher Lee. It's fantastic. And then lastly, The Ninth Gate with Johnny Depp. This is like another one of my all-time favorite movies. I've watched this movie dozens and dozens and dozens of times. The book is very different uh, than the film, but I love the, the, the visuals of the film, the feeling of it. It's just such a good movie. And, um, like, the, 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 the underpinning of it with, like, like, rich Italian Satanists is, like, so fucking hot. I love it. So, The Ninth Gate, I think it's Roman Polanski did this? Uh, yeah, Roman Polanski, uh, who did Roman, uh, Rosemary's Baby. Uh, <clears throat> very cool, slow burn type of a thing, um, and, uh, but it pays off in the end, especially if you pay attention to the details. Bruno Ribeiro asks, how can I participate in a Men of the Den video, or maybe more? So, Bruno, if you want to be involved in a Men of the Den video, you know, engage with us, talk to us. Um, there's a way that you can do uh, video comments and responses, I think. At least there used to be a way to do that. Um, so, uh, consider posting your own videos, or, like, engage us in a conversation through our YouTube comments section, or through our Facebook comments section. Those are the two areas that we look at the most. Um, and post your videos and share those to us and tell us if you've done a response video for yourself because I think that would be really cool and we could start a dialogue together, okay?